We live in an age of unrest. This was made undeniably clear yesterday when thousands of Trump supporters stormed the US Capitol to overturn the election. But this didn't start yesterday. From the George Floyd protests in the US, to the Yellow Vest protests in France, the Arab Spring, the revolution in Belarus, and anti-lockdown protests in Germany. Across the world, and now in the West, people are taking to the streets and rebelling against the establishment. Many people are struggling to understand what is driving this continuing social unrest. For some, it might seem like this age of unrest came out of nowhere and was totally unpredictable. But not for Professor Jack Goldstone. This is the man who developed a model that predicted the current social unrest in the United States and Western Europe over 10 years ago. And that's why we've invited him to Room for Discussion to discuss his model, the driving forces behind social unrest, and what we can expect in the future. Welcome to Room for Discussion, Professor Jack Goldstone. Thank you. Real pleasure to be here with you. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to chat with you, your friends, your audience. Hello to everyone. Thank you. Yeah, welcome. So the world was watching the Capitol in awe yesterday. Uh, where were you when you heard Trump supporters storm the Capitol? Well, first of all, I was happily and safely at home, like most citizens of Washington, D.C. were asked to be. Mm -hmm. um, we had been told really all week that a large number of Trump supporters would be assembling. Uh, this was no secret. It was planned. They were going to have a meeting uh, with the president in the ellipse area near the White House. And then there was a planned march to the Capitol. Of course, there was no uh, expectation that it would erupt into the magnitude of uh, events that it did. But we certainly knew, particularly after the George Floyd protests in the summer, that where there are large crowds of people, there was like to, likely to be police action. And so uh, citizens of Washington, D.C. were told um, this is going to be a potentially uh, tumultuous event. Better if you stay at home. And so I was yeah. about a mile and a half away uh, watching wow. on TV. The rest of the world. Okay. And so let's just discuss also what happened because um, the Congress was certifying the Electoral College votes, and traditionally this is just a ceremonial process. Can you explain to us why it became such a contested one? Well, the answer to that is the same as when you ask why did almost anything political happen in the United States over the last few years? And that is the January 6th joint session was publicly targeted by President Trump as an event of significance to him. So as you say, it's normally a formality. The members of Congress meet to count the electoral votes that have been cast and certified. There are no surprises. Everybody knows what the vote's been. And the result is a foregone conclusion. Uh, that's always been the case, uh, even in the contested Gore uh, versus Bush election. By the time it got to the January 6th count, everybody accepted the result. And Gore himself announced his own defeat, just as Vice President Pence did uh, last night. That's how we do it in the United States. That's how we hold our peaceful transition of power. But what we've never had before is a president who refuses to accept that he was defeated. And so President Trump has highlighted a number of friction points that he wanted to make blockades to his opponent being uh, formally accredited with the victory. Uh, there had been others, meetings of the state legislatures and so on. But January 6th had become for Trump the big one. And in fact, he tweeted, come to Washington, no. be there January 6th, It'll be wild. That's literally what he said. So wow. President Trump basically incited people to make this an important day. Yeah. And the people came, and uh, it started out as a protest, but it quickly turned violent. Uh, how do you characterize this? Was it a protest, or do you say, uh, yeah, it's, um, or it's um, a mob, or even as domestic terrorism? How do you call this? Well, I think those, those are all accurate words. Some people have said it was a coup. I don't think that's correct. <laughs> yeah. People who occupied the Capitol were not planning to proclaim a new government. Yeah. But I will say, several of them did shout out in the Capitol, Trump was elected. Trump is our president. 
So there, there was a kind of element of the purpose is to make sure that Trump knows people want him to stay in office. Yeah. But it was a protest and became an act of domestic terrorism. That is, it became an act of violence against people and property with the intent to have a political impact, to frighten people either in the government or in the populace. And, and it worked. I and mean, there's no doubt that the people in Congress were shaken. Now, it didn't have the effect that people wanted because the number of Congress people supporting Trump actually declined after this event. Yeah. But certainly the protesters believed that uh, Trump won the election, that it was being stolen, and that they had to do something dramatic to show that they believed Trump's narrative and they were behind him. Yeah. We will never back down was the wow. slogan we see most often. Yeah, and you already said it, it wasn't generally known that it was going to be this violent and dramatic, but um, in November you already said that um, the behavior of Trump after uh, losing the elections uh, r yeah, reminded you of uh, some authoritarian regime holding on to something that was already lost. Um, so. Did you see this coming in a way, or uh, was it a complete surprise or shock to you? No, no, it was certainly not a surprise. Um, let me distinguish between the short-term dynamics of a protest event becoming a riot no. and the longer-term build-up to mobilizing people for massive protest. So first of all, this year has been a year of massive protests around the country. Whether it was uh, Black Lives Matter protesters demanding justice for themselves and victims of police violence, or whether it was protesters demanding justice for Trump's followers feeling he was cheated. Now, there were protests that turned into uh, similar events actually yesterday in Olympia, Washington, the capital of Washington state. There was an effort to enter that capital building. There was an effort uh, to enter the capital building in Georgia where they had a election mm -hmm. yesterday, but also a dispute over the actions of the Secretary of State. So this was a year in which there were lots of protests, both political protests, racial justice protests. That was going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Now, when you talk about, well, what happened yesterday? How did it get so out of control? And there, a lot of the dynamics of a particular protest event depend on the interaction of police and protesters. And I'm reminded of a similar event that I was also living in and got caught up in some years ago, the Rodney King riots in Los Angeles that ended up torching large portions of commercial uh, Los Angeles. And those were also about police brutality. Yeah, what happened there is you had large protests that were expected over the treatment of Rodney King, but the Los Angeles police did not react strongly to limit the initial protests. When people came out and kind of surrounded a police station, uh, the police commissioner was at a dinner and he gave orders, don't do anything. And so the police simply withdrew. But once protesters saw the police withdrawing, they became mm -hmm. emboldened, their numbers grew, they became more violent. And something similar happened here. The protesters, as everybody expected, walked from the White House area about uh, a mile and a quarter to the U.S. Capitol building, but once they got to the U.S. Capitol building, they found that their numbers were very large compared to the local police. Mm. And when they started pushing on the barricades, the police apparently had instructions, you know, don't use deadly force, don't shoot back at the crowd right away. And so they sprayed a bit of mace and they waved their batons and the crowd said, oh, they're, they're not really going to do anything to stop us. And then That's the cool. crowd pushed forward and the mm more momentum the crowd got, the more the police had to retreat. Now remember, these are mainly Capitol Police with a little supplement of uh, DC police because the Capitol building is not part of the city of Washington, DC. It's a separate federal installation. And we didn't have the kind of federal troops from Homeland Security that President Trump had called out in July anticipating the Black Lives Matter protests. Mm. Exactly. And that's partly because you know Trump and the people in the White House said, these are our people, they're good, they won't do anything wrong, so we don't need to be prepared for terrible things like they thought with the Black Lives Matter protesters. So when you have a large protest, a very weak and inadequate initial police response, it does tend to escalate and the crowd 
kind of thrives on its own success and pushes forward more and more. So that so things got out of control in a terrible way yesterday. But the fact that there were large protests, well, that just comes from what I've been talking about and writing about the fact that exactly. across the country, yeah. so many people believe passionately that something is wrong, that severe injustice is being done to them and their families and their communities. And that's the driving force behind all of this. It's a real passion. Yeah. Yeah. So sort of in light of what happened, you know, last night, I mean, even when Trump called for the support, uh, his supporters to go home, he still maintained that, you know, the election was stolen from him. And so what is sort of the likelihood of, for instance, either Mike Pence activating the 25th Amendment to remove him or Congress may be impeaching and removing him, you know, within the next two weeks? Yeah. Again, other than the Civil War, we've never had a situation where, first of all, the president uh, resisted leaving office after losing an election. All mm -hmm. American presidents have accepted the principle of you do your darndest, you fight your hardest until the vote is in. And after the vote is in, you stop fighting. Mm -hmm. That's been the rule that made our democracy work. So President Trump's been defying that rule, and he still does. He, he put out a statement last night. He was pressured by his staff. You have to say there'll be an orderly transition. You can't leave it hanging. So he put out this crazy statement that says, even though I won the election and the yeah. facts bear me out, there will be an orderly transition of power on the 20th. But I will never stop fighting, and this may be the end of the first term, but we're going to you know, make America great again. Yeah. So he, he's, he's got like a, a bit in his mouth that he's charging with. Yeah. So that, that is new, and we don't have a good way to deal with that. The 25th Amendment was really made to deal with a president who was incapacitated by injury or illness. It was not made to deal with a president who is kind of gone rogue and refuses to follow the rules of the system. Impeachment was the mechanism for removing a president that had acted contrary to national interests. But impeachment, as we've seen, is a process that can take a couple of weeks. So it's hard to see doing it now. Yeah. Now, you know, if, if it was an emergency, could Congress rush through an impeachment in a couple of days? If it was fairly unanimous, yes. But since we've already seen 100 congressmen and a dozen senators willing to say, well, maybe there were problems in the election and we have to take these claims seriously, mm. I don't think impeachment would be a, a quickly done deal. Yeah. So we're probably stuck for the next couple of weeks with an angry president. Yeah. But at least now he has a staff around him who is more aware of the need to kind of restrain what he's doing. And, yeah. and Twitter and Facebook are on alert that they're going to have to uh, take care with what goes out. Yeah. yeah. But Section 4 of the 25th Amendment is actually uh, a section that, allow, that enables a president to be removed un involuntarily, right? It does up to a point. The way it works is a majority of the cabinet has to join the vice president in making a declaration that they feel the president is no longer fit to carry on. Hmm. Now, it's not even clear whether that rule applies to acting members of the cabinet who have not been confirmed by the Senate. You could argue that acting cabinet members don't have the authority to act under the 25th Amendment, hmm. but that's reserved to cabinet members who have been confirmed, not people who are temporarily holding that seat. Yeah. Well, because Trump has preferred to have acting uh, secretaries in many seats because he considers them uh, you know, more subject to his personal control, um, we have a number of actings. And then you have a number of uh, cabinet secretaries who are personal friends or very loyal to Trump. Uh, Betsy DeVos, uh, Wilbur, uh, Commerce Secretary. Um, so it, it's not clear you could even get a majority of confirmed cabinet members to do it. Yeah. And if they did it, the president has the right under the 25th Amendment to say, no, I, I'm competent, I can do it. And if he makes that claim, uh, then Congress has to vote by two thirds to remove him. Okay. And wow. even that, as I say, you know, <laughs> may not be an easy done deal. So you know, even though people are talking about these options, let's impeach him tonight. Yeah. Let's invoke the 25th Amendment. He's dangerous. He's out of his mind. He's not accepting reality. He lost. He won't <laughs> accept that he lost. Yeah. What can we do? Well, frankly, if this had started back in November, you know, the, the day that Trump said, 
um, it's all a fraud, I'm not going to do it. And when, once it became clear that he was committed to this narrative of convincing tens of millions of people to believe that the election was stolen, that's when Congress or the cabinet should have intervened. Yeah. But the attitude was, well, it's just harmless talk. You know, he, he's an emotional guy. He has an ego. Uh, let him, you know, if, he, if he's comforted by the theory that he really won, uh, let him enjoy that. It won't do any harm. Well, we've seen where that goes. And, and my feeling is simply lies are evil. If you cannot stop public officials who are invested with the public trust from lying, you will end up in serious trouble. And, and yeah. you know, that effort really has not been part of that. The Trump administration has been built on lies from the beginning. That's why we have so many dead from COVID-19, among other problems. Wow. Yeah, I know I need words have consequences. And, you know, we could talk about this for almost the full interview. But, you know, we'd like to sort of, you know, dive into the model. Of course, I think the audience wants to know sort of the drivers of social unrest. And so we, we sort of want to ask, you know, in your model, you, of course, you apply all sorts of different data from different countries. Uh, to predict, right. you know, political instability events. But how, how exactly do you define political instability? Like, Yeah, the model is something I developed looking at revolutions across history because I was struck by two things. One, revolutions are generally unexpected when they occur. And I think that will continue to be the case because even the model doesn't give you a kind of fine detail, this will happen on October 1st kind of thing. Yeah. It simply gives you an indicator of uh, are the risks rising or yeah. falling, and how high are they relative to other times? But I wanted to get at least that kind of a barometer for uh, risk of major unrest. So I started looking at what's going on in a society. And a lot of people have said, well, you know, revolutions, those, those come about when uh, poor societies are starting to modernize or get developed. Uh, the famous Marxist model was when you have a transition in the means of production, so a new stage in history. And people kind of said, all right, well, those, those things are all behind us now, right? <laughs> Even when I was in graduate school, people said, the age of revolutions is over because yeah, now we have yeah. modern societies, it won't happen anymore. Now, that, now, I was in graduate school quite a while ago, so that was uh, before 1980. Yeah. And if you look at what's happened in the world since then, from the uh, revolutionary overthrow of communist regimes in Europe and the Soviet Union, to the color revolutions around the world and these waves of protests, so obviously it's not over. So what is going on? Well, what the model says is it turns this question around, and instead of saying what makes people angry, I say, look, there are always going to be things that make people angry. That's life. That's human beings, right? But what is it that keeps a society capable of moving forward through time? What, what are the essentials to have a society be stable? So I thought if I can find out what do you need to be stable, you'll understand how it goes the other way when things go wrong. Yeah. So what does a society need to be stable? Well, the government needs to have the loyalty of major officials, business elites, religious elites, because after all, if there are influential leaders in society who are opposed to the government, it's difficult for the government to manage uh, peacefully. So that's one. So then I start asking, what are the things that make elite groups who you think, hey, these guys are vested in the existing power structure, why would they overturn it? Yeah. And it, it turns out that there's you know, fairly reliable situations when you have a big surge in population, when you have many more people who are aspiring to elite positions, but many of them feel closed out. So in the data, this shows up as a change in social mobility. If you have a period when a lot of people are able to kind of move up in society and they feel confident, um, and that is followed by a period when social mobility declines, and then people start saying, well, that's not just because of me. It means the system is unjust. Something is uh, blocking us, keeping us out. We have to change it. Or if the economy starts to slow down so that there's not enough economic growth to keep all of the elites who want to have wealth and influence happy and they start competing with each other excessively and that can lead to factionalism so when you have a concentration of wealth and a slowdown in social mobility you're more likely to get these feuds between different factions yeah. over who should really be in charge now normally it's the job of the ruler to make sure different factions work these things out and get along and it doesn't threaten people. But there are a number of things that can undercut the ability of the ruler to do that. First, obviously, is financial. 
if the government has a lot of resources to buy different people off and to make deals that can smooth things over but if the government is starting to get financially strained if revenues are not keeping up with expenses if debts are growing if there's an excessive commitment to military expenditures all of these can lead to kind of fights over how government money should be spent and that tends to handicap the ruler in making deals instead he kind of has to go with one side or the other and then finally conflict between elites and weakness of the ruler is essential for things to go wrong but of course you also need the fuel of popular discontent and grievances so that you can mobilize people for these causes so what mobilizes people well there are a lot of different factors because people are quite diverse and they're all different kinds of things some can be injustice to racial or religious groups some can be a decline in prospects for work and employment and wages and social mobility some can be a concentration of uh, new urbanization and a kind of uh, fault lines between urban and rural groups yeah. and in the united states uh, and in much of europe we've been seeing all of those things you know the economy has preferentially favored urban centers and left uh, the non-major urban and rural centers uh, much less economically dynamic we've had a decline in productivity we've had a shift of inequality that favors the well-off and it's definitely been very harsh more so in america and the uk but also in parts of europe uh, so it's possible to track these factors and measure them over time. And when you put them together in the model, it puts out a number called the political stability index no. that kind of says, is the overall combination of these weaknesses in the stability of rule getting worse? And for the United States, the numbers have been getting uh, worse since the 1980s. They were actually quite good after World War II, we had kind of broad prosperity. There was a lot of injustice for women and for minorities, but those were smaller groups that led to local protests, not the kind of major national cleavages that prevented government from functioning. So, sorry, if I may interject that? That's where we've gotten. So if I may interject that, you, you're describing uh, the 1960s as perhaps not as uh, unstable as today, but wasn't, weren't protests actually more, more, more violent and more widespread than, than today, in fact. So is it really correct to say that that was not a polarized or unstable time with the civil rights movement and the women's movement, etc.? Well, have, having lived through that and participated in some of those protests myself, um, I can tell you it was a very different feeling. First of all, there was an enormous feeling of optimism, particularly among the um, young white population at the time. Um, student movement splintered and eventually there was this radical weathermen group that got violent because they wanted to change capitalism all at once. But what was really striking is most of the uh, hippies and the uh, free love movement, which is what characterized much of the 60s, that was a very optimistic movement for cultural change. We wanted to overthrow the kind of rigid bourgeois lifestyle that looked down on sex and drugs and rock and roll we wanted to be free and enjoy ourselves and let our emotions and feelings go now it became more radicalized in the late 60s when race riots broke out in the 60s and there were student protests both in support of the race riots and against the vietnam war it was really after 68 when the protests against the vietnam war went up in volume and intensity that you started to see kind of a national confrontation. But let's be clear about what was going on in the 60s. You had a number of discrete groups, students, women, blacks, mainly blacks, Hispanics were not that involved at, this, at that point, who were fighting uh, long-standing grievances about obstacles to expression and for blacks especially, problems still with voting and employment and housing discrimination. Now, those were serious grievances, they led to major protests, and they targeted the government. But the government was still functional. It no. was capable of responding with civil rights legislation. The uh, economy was booming and strong. The um, government coffers were well stocked. Uh, I wasn't worried about major crises that would lead to government becoming dysfunctional or failing 
there was there was no talk of, of civil war. I mean, there was some worry about is the black population going to go into revolt. But outside of uh, a number of urban riots, uh, that didn't occur. Now, the, remember, the United States has had race riots since slavery. It's been kind of an ongoing part of our sad history because the injustice has always been there. But that's different from uh, protests in which one political party treats the other political yeah. party as a mortal threat to the country and says, if Democrats are elected, it'll destroy the country. Or if Donald Trump gets a second term, our democracy will be over. So we're talking about different policies and a different kind and level of grievance today than in the 60s. So you're saying basically the key difference is that in the 60s, maybe the population was polarized, but the elites were not in fact polarized, whereas today the elites are basically polarized. Not to the same degree. I mean, you did have the George Wallace movement in the South and so on, and there were, there were definitely cleavages. And you could certainly say the 60s was the high point of government crisis and protest uh, prior to today. But the uh, degree of government dysfunction and measured polarization, the inability of people politically to agree with each other, that's much worse today than it was yeah. then. Yeah. And so your model, um, based on all these factors, it outputs a political stress index. Um, but does that mean that you can tell us right now um, where in the world in a few years there will be, like, for example, a civil war? Or, or does the model work differently? Well, the model does take into account, for example, younger populations mm -hmm. tend to have more violent conflicts than older ones. And even yesterday, the crowd that invaded the Capitol building had so many old people that uh, three of them seemed to have died from heart attacks due to the stress involved in the chaos oh, of really? the day. Yeah, I mean, they had four deaths, one shooting and three due to medical emergencies. Oh, yeah. And it was a crowd with a lot of people over 60. Now, that's unusual for a protest in the United States, but it kind of shows the degree to which the feeling has spread. Nonetheless, in countries with older populations, and that now includes the United States, you expect the form of protest to generally be less violent. Whereas in younger countries, you're more likely to have kind of sustained violent campaigns and violent overthrow of the government. Here, it would be more likely to have a uh, the kind of mobilizations that we've seen with uh, large marches, crowds um, contesting each other. The real problem, I think, was going to be, because the country's so divided, what would have happened if Trump uh, went further? You know, if we didn't have this event yesterday and, and Trump uh, refuses to declare uh, that he's gone? Or even more scary, uh, what if the Congress that had been elected was more Republican and more supportive and was willing to go along with Trump's fiction and toss out some electoral votes. A lot of people have said if that had, you know, or if Mike Pence had said, yeah, I'm loyal to Trump, the Constitution demands that I help our president, uh, then we would have had much, much larger protests than we saw yesterday. So consider yesterday the um, small outburst that indicates how bad things could have gotten. In no way was that kind of a peak type of event. That yeah. was a warning. Yeah. Uh, just one more question about the model itself. Um, because it relies on past data, so you use past oh. data of uh, political instability periods uh, to predict uh, coming periods of political instability. Um, but isn't there a danger then that, uh, that the model doesn't really take uh, hold of future um, or it, it doesn't, yeah, so it doesn't predict the future events well because it only relies on past data and maybe these relationships do not hold anymore. Well, that is a very thoughtful and valuable question <laughs> <laughs> because it's the bane of all social science. Not yeah. only is the case that we have to use past data to look at the future, but we're not looking at inanimate objects where we think we have a rule of nature that will persist over time. Um, we have to be aware that people are learning from what they see in history, and so they may very consciously choose to act differently in the future yeah. than their counterparts did in the past. So you're right, there's always a risk that things will be different in the future. And one of the things I've mentioned is that as societies age, yeah. the way they display their protests uh, tends to become more moderate. That's why we have more color revolutions around the world now 
and fewer of the really violent ones. Where we've had the really violent ones, like in Syria and, and Afghanistan, you still have much younger populations, so large bodies of angry young men to draw upon. But the basic data itself, you have to make sure that the data you collect accurately reflects what's going on. So you want good data on inequality, and that may be different for a peasant landed society than for an urban working society. So you need different measures of how income is gathered. But remember, the model asks what is necessary for a society to operate stably over time. Yeah. And any society needs to have a government with revenues that support what's expected of it. Yeah. Any government needs to have elites that are reasonably loyal and united in support of the government. Yeah. Any government needs to have most of the population not deeply aggrieved about how the government is conducting its business and how that's affecting their lives. So given that the model is not geared to events of any particular time period, but is focusing on what are the really key elements that any society needs. It's like if you say, for any living being, you need to have air, food, and water to survive. Any society needs a uh, financially sound government, a unified and loyal elite structure, and a majority of the population that is reasonably satisfied and confident that the government is not undermining or destroying their lives. Yeah. That's the air, food, and water yeah. for a large society. So that is, I think, pretty stable. And in fact, we've used this model on societies from everything to uh, ancient empires to the modern United States, and it's held up pretty well. All right. No, so uh, you've basically laid out, I think, very clearly, you know, how sort of the, the elites, the uh, mass population and demographics and state institutions sort of work together to, you know, create or not create, you know, a political instability. And so we'd sort of like to apply that to, you know, the current situation, you know, in the United States. And sort of uh, just to quote you from, uh, I think, a month ago or so, you, you yourself said, uh, if American democracy was a patient, it would be overweight, out of shape, on a bad diet, and you could say that we just kind of had a heart attack, but it was mild and we've been revived. And <laughs> this paints a pretty you know, bleak picture of the United States. And obviously you've, uh, you focus very much on elites as sort of a, a driver of this. So can you explain how, how this has sort of unfolded in the United States? Sure. Well, as I say, we have to go back to the uh, 1980s, maybe even to the post-war period. After World War II, the United States had a plus and a minus. Um, the plus is we were the major country that had been left largely untouched by combat operations in World War II. Yes, we fought all over the world, but there was not uh, major military action on U.S. territory. And we had built up this huge capacity in factories for military manufacturing. We mobilized the population. Uh, most of the other major countries of the world, uh, Japan, Europe, uh, had been devastated by the war. So the U.S. was in a very dominant and privileged position. Our currency became the global currency, took over from the British pound. Our economy was the biggest and uh, was becoming the most advanced. And we were able to put a huge portion of our population into college in the uh, 50s and 60s with the GI Bill so that we ended up with a better education base than most of our uh, competitor countries. So the U.S. was in very good shape. Uh, economically, there were jobs for everyone, houses, the suburbs were being built. Unfortunately, women were asked to stay in those suburban houses and have kids. Um, but by and large, the society was on a pretty good track. The negative, we had, we had these huge debts. So what did we do? We imposed very large taxes on the wealthy. When we came out of World War II, the top marginal tax rate was 90%. Uh, and stayed high. The top marginal tax rate stayed very high for a long time. And companies felt that it would be wrong to over reward their executives. So the chief executives took home salaries 20 to 30 times that of their line workers. And most companies were national at that point, still not international. So you didn't have this concentration of wealth at the top. Banking was boring. That may be hard to believe. But we spoke of bankers hours. They go open the bank office from 10 to 3 and then head for the golf course because uh, writing loans was simple. You took a mortgage loan for a person, you said, you're home, you're, uh, here's a 3% loan, with, uh, that's 
all it was. And everything, everything kind of flowed fairly simply. Um, and it was a booming period in real estate and science. And then people look back on it. As you say, the 60s, you know, you remember now the riots and the anti-war protests. But there was also the huge development of the Sun Belt and the space industry and cars taking over the country, building the interstate freeway system. So that put America in a very solid position. But by the 1980s, elites wanted more. You had yes. people who saw opportunities in finance. Now, we've generated all this wealth in the last 40 years since World War II. What do we do with it? How can we use it more efficiently? And so people started developing ways to do it. Now, there's very early on, there was a huge scandal about building office uh, real estate in Arizona. I don't know if you remember that. Uh, the Keating scandal is kind of banished from our memory. Uh, also, a few decades after that, there was the Enron scandal. But what both of these indicate is that elites were starting to feel free to game the system. Yeah. Instead of saying the way to make money is to invest in new industries, the way to make money is to lend the capital we already have mm. in ever more creative ways. And so you have you know, credit card industry is getting 18 to 20% plus fees from consumers and creative financing to allow more people to do things. Now that had certain advantages, but it was easy to go off the rails. And when Reagan came in, they thought, we've got to remove some of these limitations on capitalism. Let's lower the tax rates on high-end earners. Let's lower the tax rates on corporations. Let's reward corporations for investment. And you know, and all of this was fairly good for a few decades. And it co coincided happily with the digital revolution, the development of personal computers, uh, Apple phones, uh, you know, consumer electronics. So all of this started to look good on the surface. But what was happening underneath, and this was really not realized, and I, I blame even you know so-called liberal elites who are supposed to be watching out for people, they didn't see at all that what was happening is the economy of the United States was increasingly dominated by both digital industries and finance. And what is characteristic of both digital industries and finance is they don't employ a lot of people, yeah. OK? It's not like big manufacturing factories. So General Motors was going bankrupt because they had so many obligations to their union workers that had built up over the years. And other big manufacturing companies were shipping jobs overseas because American union workers were too expensive. And the really prosperous parts of the economy that were taking in, you know, growing rapidly were finance and uh, information technologies. But the, the net result of all of this was that large portions of the traditional American economy, they used to, oh, the Rust Belt and things like that, but it was much broader than that. In general, er, all the areas that were outside of these two finance and digital areas, so uh, commerce of all kinds, uh, tourism, restaurant industries, um, farming, um, and of course, manufacturing, uh, all of these things became less profitable over time. And people either drew stagnant or fewer wages. The union deals were kind of taken apart. Pensions were reduced. Uh, all of the things that made being an American worker so wonderful started to get stripped away. And as I said, this kind of happened below the scenes. We didn't really see it. Even in the 90s and the early 2000s, when we had the opioid epidemic, and for the first time in 100 years, life expectancy in the United States, the most advanced nation in the world, so we thought. Life expectancy started to go down, wow. something that hadn't been seen for a century. And it did because there were so many workers who were left out living on disability or shifting to less valuable uh, work. They got uh, sank their problems in alcohol or drugs. And we had what uh, Angus Deaton called these deaths of despair. So this transformation of America from a country that really, in a way, put the working person first, but also had great opportunities for business, great opportunities for immigrants, a real dynamic mixing bowl of economic vitality, even though, yes, there were high taxes. Yes, there was regulation. But you know what? Productivity growth uh, was higher than it is now. Yeah. So as we got into the 80s and 90s, we see a greater dominance of finance and global corporations that reduce what they're paying for labor and increase the rewards to executives. 
And by the time we get to about 2010, we have executives in the US earning 300, not 20 or 30, but hundreds of times what line workers make. We have titans of finance making hundreds of millions, in some cases, hedge fund managers a billion dollars a year and paying only 15% income tax on that because of various uh, tax schemes that were passed to protect hedge fund managers. And so you had this enormous concentration of wealth at the top, enormous competition for uh, conspicuous consumption, high-end apartments, $50 million homes. Uh, but at the same time, large numbers of communities all across the country were saying, wait a minute, why aren't we sharing in that growth? No. And the sense of injustice was becoming widespread. So there were certainly injustices to people of color. And many on the kind of liberal left focused on, we have to rectify those injustices. But what was missed was the injustice that was being done to many good old fashioned white Christian Protestant Americans who had worked hard all their lives, but now saw the communities and industries they were in under stress. Now, I don't wanna say uh, as some people do, well, you know, oh, it's those unemployed workers that are backing Trump. No, that's not true. The biggest gains in voting support for Trump in 2020 compared to 2016 was people making over $100,000 a year. So one has to understand that this, what the model is picking up on is the struggles at both levels. Yeah. It's not just that some Americans are being left behind, it's that even those Americans that have lots of money don't feel secure. They're worried that other people or the government are going to take their money away and then they won't be able to keep up with the other people who are really rich. Yeah. Yeah. I'd actually like to press on that one because I think you talk about, uh, you know, in your work about sort of an increasing, you know, competition uh, between elites for, you know, limited positions. And you tie that, I think, to the rise of, you know, college graduates. So can you explain sort of how this competition between elites, uh, how that affects political instability? Sure. Again, elites are not all of one kind. There are the rich who are not like you or me, right? <laughs> so that there are people who um, never have to get on a crowded airplane because they have private jets to take them wherever they wish. They never have to stand in lines to check into a hotel because they have private islands or they own life. acreage in Patagonia, Montana, okay? So, so the ultra rich has developed a kind of Ayn Rand mythology about themselves that says we are the people who made these huge fortunes. And now, this has happened in America before, right? We had the Carnegies and the Rockefellers. But in the early 1900s, American government saw, you know, these huge fortunes by the Fricks, the Rockefellers, the, that's gonna undermine democracy. It's gonna undermine the competitiveness of the economy. So we have to do something about it. So the progressive era came up with antitrust, they broke up Standard Oil, they broke up the railways, they restored a kind of competitive balance. And that still left some speculative bubbles. Uh, after World War I, we had the Roaring Twenties and a bubble then. Um, but once we got into the 40s, we kind of put things back together and it worked very well for a while. But now we're in kind of the second gilded age where companies got huge. They push their reach, they're competing for CEOs, and the CEOs have said, yeah, we deserve several hundred times hmm. what uh, workers get because we've built these companies or we, we've done this and done that or I've invented this or that. The sense that actually it's not healthy for a society to have people who earn so much money and accumulate it. It's fine if they earn it, actually. I don't mind. Let, let people earn that money and be proud of it and boast of it hmm. as long as they either have to give most of it back to society through charity or taxation. So it comes back and rebuilds the society in which they made their wealth, that's fine. But now people feel this is private wealth mm -hmm. and the government has no right to go after our private wealth and to tax it or tell us how to use it. Oh. Now that is a situation that we haven't had in this country for a hundred years. Like I said, we had it before, but uh, we haven't had it for a while. So we have this fight between the uh, ultra wealthy private rich and the government over what should the top tax rates be. And it's become so bitter that we, you know, we had one financier to say, you know, if you come after my 
income tax for uh, carried interest, you know, that's, that's like uh, Hitler invading Europe. It's uh, mm. evil, bad, oh. awful. Okay, yeah. so that's, that's where we are at the ultra rich. Now, other elites, people like me, successful professionals who enjoy $100,000 plus incomes, we should be happy and comfortable. And most of us are, but you know what? It's harder and harder for us to afford a house in a major city the universities that used to be free or relatively low cost have gotten very expensive. So you have crazy things like these Hollywood stars who hire consultants to take uh, pictures of their kids as athletic, uh, great athletes to say, you know, how do we get them into USC or how do we get them into Harvard? We have to cheat because it's no longer fair. No. What does it say about your society? if you feel, well, we're running a merit-based society where people have to earn and deserve what they get, but other people say, well, you know, if we have money, we can get around that. We can cheat the system and, and push other people out. That is so destructive of anyone's confidence in the society. Mm. So yeah, when I talk about elite competition, it is super wealthy protecting their wealth from what they see as a bad government rather than seeing it as the need to share and invest in society. And then it's other people who should be comfortable elites mm. having to fight with each other for what are increasingly expensive and competitive prerequisites of what they consider to be kind of a normal middle-class life, right? Mm. A nice house in a safe neighborhood with a college education for your kids. Even that now requires more money or more connections than yeah. used to be the case. But then if the elites uh, become more anxious of losing their wealth or having to fight among the other elites uh, to get uh, what they need, then of course inequality still continues to rise. And if I understand you correctly, this also means that the competition among elites becomes even larger. So it sounds like quite a cycle um, in what way could you break such a cycle? Well, you break such a cycle by breaking up the great concentrations of wealth. That's what the uh, antitrust laws did uh, at the turn of the century under Teddy Roosevelt, the trust busters and so on. And we've let, you know, there, there's talk now about using the antitrust laws on Facebook and Google, and that's kind of long overdue. But it's, it's more than that. There are problems that have arisen with the ultra wealthy all around the world, certainly in the UK, as well as Switzerland, Amsterdam, all across Europe, figuring out how to hide their wealth from mm. governments so it won't yeah. be taxed. You know, you've probably yeah. read about offshore havens and the Panama Papers and all of that. And well, we are an offshore haven here in the Netherlands. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, so is Wilmington, uh, Delaware, where American corporations can put up shelf uh, companies. Now, actually, people don't really know this, but the latest budget that was uh, forced on President Trump to sign over much objections actually had a law, a new law, to prevent shell companies from being anonymous. This is actually a huge, huge blow against corruption and the ability of the wealthy to hide money from taxation and to hide corruption. So that's progress. And I think we're going to see a lot more of that. If the wealthy simply paid what they honestly owe according to existing laws, yeah. that would be a lot more than they pay now, even though those laws are designed wow. to be generous and to favor them. But it's yeah. never enough once you get to that point, yeah. surprisingly. Um, and so we, we need to bring things into the light. We need to have transparency. People need to declare their assets and their income openly and honestly and have consequences for not doing so. Yeah. And if they earn money in the United States, they shouldn't be able to shift those earnings to Ireland or the Cayman Islands. And, and you know, we should have a system, as I said, even William uh, Buffett, uh, you know, says, you know, I shouldn't pay less marginal tax than my secretary. That's not right. And um, it's certainly the case that America has let its tax system kind of mutate into a monster that, that threatens us. So we need to address that. But there will also have to be some higher taxes on groups that have done exceptionally well in the last few years. And there'll have to be some efforts to make more of a level playing field for people who want more uh, opportunities for upward mobility. But all of these things can be done. They've been done. We can do them again and they can restore the sense that America is for all Americans. Yeah. A lot of the anger you saw in that attack on the Capitol was anger for people feeling that 
oh, America is really, it's just for the privileged. These people in the halls of Congress, they don't really have to work. They're just looking after themselves. We're the only ones looking out for us. And that's why we have to do this. Yeah. Okay, so we have elites getting more selfish and competing among themselves. Um, how does this affect uh, the functioning of state institutions? Well, you can think about it this way. Um, I, I talk about the U.S. being a, a patient, okay? Yeah. <laughs> in, in a healthy body, when you eat food, it is digested and then distributed to all the parts of the body that need it. When a country generates income and wealth, it also needs to be distributed to all the parts of society that need it. Now, to be sure, if people are not working, I'm not in favor of simply giving them a basic income and rewarding them. Hmm. But I do feel that people who are willing to work, who have worked, who are working, deserve to have an income that allows them to maintain themselves and a family at a decent, healthy standard of living. Now, in Europe, you have the advantage that people don't need to worry about saving for college. If their kids are qualified, they are covered for their education by the state. They don't have to worry about uh, being bankrupted by unexpected health expenses yeah. because of national health insurance. You also don't have to support such a large world-spanning military as we do. Your contributions to NATO are significant and important, but not as big a drain. So Americans, I don't blame them. They feel they pay huge taxes, but what do they get for them? Yeah. They still have to worry about educating their kids. They have to worry about paying somehow for their health care or very expensive health insurance. And a lot of their tax money goes to this huge defense uh, operation from which they see no immediate benefits. So yeah, people are angry. I don't want to pay taxes. What mm -hmm. do I get out of it? Yeah. And when you get to the super wealthy who can afford to protect themselves and pay all their own expenses, they start to think, you know, government's my foe. I mean, they're going to take my money and spend it on other people who need things like health care and pensions and retirement that I don't need. Why should I pay for that? Now, that's a very destructive mindset. Once elites start feeling like they are the princes and they don't owe anything to the rest of the population, then you can't have a democracy you can't have a free and open society. So I think we actually need culturally to try and change that and to say, yes, you guys who built great businesses, who wrote brilliant novels, mm -hmm. uh, who have built magnificent buildings, you do deserve to be rewarded, but those rewards cannot corrupt and undermine our society. Especially when you get to the point where you allow money to play a role in politics. Exactly. And yeah. So you create this kind of a corrupt knot tying together political leaders who can benefit from giving favors to the wealthy and the wealthy who used to be told, yeah, you can earn money in the private sector, but that's not politics. Politics is for the people. Politics is for democracy where one man, one vote. Well, once those things intertwine too much and the wealthy start to say, you know, if we can influence politics, we can get laws to help us get even wealthier, mm. then the purpose of government starts to become helping the rich get richer, not helping average people do better and be more secure. And you know, that is the direction that autocracies go, is the purpose of an autocratic government is to keep the wealth in the hands of the wealthy. Uh, democracy is supposed to be different, mm -hmm. but we're losing some of that in, in the last 30 odd mm. years. Yeah, because we've also seen uh, the U.S. Uh, political institutes get paralyzed, actually, because of the polarization and also the competition between different groups of elites. Uh, yeah. Now, Biden, of course, recently just managed to uh, gain a razor thin margin in the Senate. Um, do you think with that margin, uh, we can expect to see less polarization in the coming years uh, because the Democrats will be able to... Um, yeah, to get their plans through, or, or don't you think so? I certainly hope so. And I think the razor-thin majority is, in some ways, the best outcome. If Democrats had a large majority so that they didn't even need to pull all Democrats together, then you might see, oh, yeah, we, we, you know, we want a landslide. We can do whatever we want. We can ignore the opposition. Hmm. That's not healthy either. Uh, when Republicans started to say, we're not even going to bring legislation to a vote, unless a majority of Republicans approve it, 
you wiped out a whole sphere of useful action where a majority in Congress could be put together from Republicans and Democrats who agreed. So the centrist middle was essentially stripped away when Republicans got so polarized that they said only if only if Republicans approve this as a majority will we even take it to the floor. So I think that was awful. (laughs) And that was a symptom of the polarization and dysfunction we have. But I think that's going to go away. I think what we'll see now with these razor thin margins in both the House and the Senate Mm -hmm. is the need for uh, broad majorities to get things done. We're not going to see, I don't think, we may see some uh, judicial appointments, for example, uh, rushed through by a one vote party line. But in general, the more rules that are passed through by that kind of thin one-sided majority, the more unstable we are, because those are exactly the things that will be reversed the moment the opposition takes power. Doesn't matter whether you're Democrat or Republican. When we look at things like Social Security and we look at things like Medicare or even the Clean Air, the Clean Water Act, which, by the way, were both passed by Republican administrations, Mm -hmm. the reason they lasted as law is there was a broad bipartisan agreement behind them. If you don't have that, even your successes, like Obamacare, may be short-lived. So whatever we do, whether it's immigration reform or health care reform or tax reform, I hope we will have an effort to build a broad center. Let's isolate the extremists in Mm -hmm. both the Republican and Democratic parties and have the center that most Americans believe in and, and can support be the force behind legislation. Then we'll be much better off and we'll put some of these polarization and political instability problems behind us. So if you're calling for sort of policies that are agreed for by a majority of Americans or maybe, you know, closer to the center, what kind of reforms do you see, uh, you know, practically that could, you know, reduce uh, the social unrest in the United States? What kind of things can we, are we talking about? Well, you might be surprised, but a majority of Americans do support immigration reform that will expand legal immigration. Americans like immigration, generally, as long as it's legal. Uh, So if we have an orderly process that can process larger numbers of people, the economy will do better, America will grow, and I'm sure we can get broad agreement on that. I think immigration reform has been really blocked by extreme minorities, and the Trump administration pushed really hard in the direction of reducing all kinds of legal migration. So I think we'll have an immigration reform that will be solid. I think we'll finally get infrastructure because most Americans agree that our infrastructure has fallen behind leading world standards. It's terrible to have people come to America and say, your subways are old and broken down. Your roads and bridges are in awful conditions. Your airports are third world quality. Americans don't like to hear that. There'll be a huge majority in in support of improving that because it brings jobs. It's a good way to spend money. We'll certainly have broad support for uh, improving the rollout of vaccines and giving financial support to people affected by COVID. I think we'll also have broad support for uh, removing some of the anonymous shells as we've already seen Mm -hmm. and for uh, strengthening uh, enforcement of existing tax law making evasion more difficult, cracking down on people who have been fraudulent and scoffing at the law. One of the, again, little things not known. Uh, under Trump, the IRS was told, don't bother, don't go after rich people. It's too complicated. They can have too many lawyers. They bog things down in court. Didn't used to be that way. The IRS used to go after everybody, especially the rich people, because that's where they could get more money back for the U.S. government. So we need to restore that kind of vigor in our finances. Um, so I think those are the easy things, what we call the low-hanging fruit. Hmm. What will be somewhat more difficult is improving health care. But again, I think we'll find a majority because Americans do recognize that most rich people around the world have good health care as a right of citizenship, and Americans don't. I think we'll be able to build a coalition around fixing that. I don't know what the details will be that will emerge, mm-hmm. but I think if you can get it, we, you know, we did Social Security, we did Medicare, we can do a national health plan of some sort. It'll combine private and public. It'll combine insurance and other elements. 
but it's going to be better than what we have now where Americans live in fear of not having proper health care. But how realistic is that given that, for instance, you know, of course the health insurance companies are donating to both parties, both Democrats and Republicans, and if you look at someone maybe who wanted to do an overhaul of the health care system, I think Bernie Sanders wanted a universal health care system, but that was blocked. So how realistic really is it that those kind of more maybe radical, more, uh, more income distributing policies that you talk about to reduce inequality, that they will actually be implemented? Well, here's the good news. Because Democrats have a narrow majority, they cannot be completely stymied. They can tell the Republicans, if you don't work with us, you're going to end up on the losing side of some extreme measures that get 100% Democrat support. Hmm. Or you can work with us on a measure that might only have 70% Democrat support that would lose the Elizabeth Warrens and the uh, extreme progressives. But you know, if you give us half of your Republican votes and we have two thirds of our Democrat votes, we can pass something that will keep the extremists at bay. But if you don't, you know, if you're gonna go in your shell and not cooperate, we're gonna have to work with our extreme wing to pass something that Democrats can do on their own. So I think Biden can say, look, don't put me in a box. Don't push me to where I have to satisfy my progressives first. Work with me together and let's rebuild the center. That's Biden's inclination. That's his history. Those are his contacts in the Senate and in the House. So I'm very optimistic that that can be done. Right. So we're approaching the end of the interview. So let's look a bit into the future. Um, Firstly, short term, how do you see things unfolding in the next 14 days? Well, in the next 14 days, I believe the effort of the White House staff will be to try and restrain President Trump. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I imagine that Trump will call for another rally or support. Uh, I think law enforcement, if there is such a rally, will now be on notice to be better prepared. So I, I expect Trump to still try and uh, spread his lies that he didn't lose and to appeal for support has been financially good for him. So I, I think the main thing people have to realize is it's taken decades to build up this degree of social division. Nothing's going to change it, not this uh, revulsion at the riot in the Capitol, mm -hmm. not Trump leaving office. These are superficial things. In order for us to avoid the risk of massive social unrest recurring, periodically in the next few years, we have to start to turn around this ship and attack some of these underlying conditions. We need to address lack of social mobility and the heightened level of inequality. We need to address people's economic fears about what will happen in the future. Will their communities, you know, do they have, do they have a path for their children even to move forward in life? A lot of people feel despair. Mm -hmm. um, we need to overcome the polarization and dysfunction among our elites. That's why I'm saying I'm optimistic, but it's absolutely essential that a center is built. And that's why I think it's so great that Biden won this narrow majority. If the Senate remained Republican and they chose to just stonewall and, and turn the Biden uh, administration into a failure at any cost, then the polarization would get worse. We'd be stuck in this. People would lose their faith in government and we'd have a horrible mess going into the next elections. Mm. If the next two years can demonstrate centrists can work together, that will help centrist politicians in both parties do better in 2022 and get us more in the right direction we need. The progressive movement took a couple of decades to get America on a better path. We need a new progressive movement. Uh, it, it's nice to say that uh, President Trump is the first American incumbent since Herbert Hoover to lose the presidency, the House, and the Senate. Yeah. And what came after Hoover was difficult times at first and a real challenge, but a lot of good progressive legislation that won large majority support and that transformed America. That's literally where we got Social Security and, uh, in the first place, right? Yeah. So this may be another such positive time when America can pull its center together again. And if it does so, I think we can get out of this mess. And I hope 10 years from now, my model will say, uh, <laughs> look, America has backed off from this curve. We're in a much more stable domain. 
and we can start to rebuild our economy and society as the liberal democracy that Americans love and want. So that's my hope for the future here. Yeah. Now, Let's hope around the world. rest of the world, there's a lot of injustice. <laughs> there are revolutions to come. Don't count it out. The Arab Spring was not the last gasp, mm. so beware. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's hope the model stays positive about the states at least. <laughs> Yes, indeed. Well, you know, we're living in a, uh, a coronavirus world. Vaccines are rolling out. And sort of, you know, to finish off, do you have any sort of, you know, predictions for, uh, you know, how the world will be in the United States or Western Europe uh, in a post-COVID world? Well, the post, you know, thing about COVID, I did some examination of what has happened in the wake of past epi epidemics. And an epidemic like this that kills only about 1% to 2% of its victims tends not to be transformative in terms of politics. Okay. The, you, know, you need something like the Black Death to really shake up society, uh, where you know, one in three, one in four people die. Then, then society has to be put back together. Yeah. But this COVID disaster will simply, I hope, and I think most likely, go down like the, you know, like the great flu epidemic of 1918 uh, as a medical public health tragedy but not something that changed the political direction in any of the countries around the world. In fact, I, I did a close look at this, and it turns out even most of the dictatorships uh, in China and Russia, they've been strengthened, if anything, uh, by COVID. Uh, populist governments have done fine. Uh, maybe Boris Johnson will be damaged in the United Kingdom because they're struggling with the new variant and they've got lockdown problems, and they have many of the same underlying instability divisions that, that we do. Mm -hmm. um, and in a sense, you know, COVID did demonstrate brutally how divided and dysfunctional governments are in many parts of the world, even as it demonstrated that places like Taiwan and Australia and South Korea, places that kind of have functioning governments that people trust and will mm -hmm. follow, can actually respond to emergencies much better than places where people do not trust the government and they do not trust each other. Yeah. Uh, and are willing to make political statements out of everything. That, that's very damaging. But I hope post-COVID will simply say, we, we've got to build a government we can trust. We have to learn to uh, take care of our neighbors the way we want to take care of ourselves. We can't simply say, oh, blue cities, blue state, they're our enemies, too bad for them. Uh, or we can't say, you know, I don't, I, you know, I, I believe the president, but not his public health advisors <laughs> because I like their politics. All of those things end up with people in body bags. So I hope we learn that mm -hmm. lesson, but that our political institutions go on uh, more or less as we had wanted them to. Well, well, thank you so much. I think this was a, a very interesting discussion, you know, for us and, uh, and for the audience as well. Obviously, those who were not able to catch it live, it will be uploaded to uh, YouTube in a couple of days, and it will also be available on Facebook. So make sure to catch that. And you know, thank you so much for joining us. This was uh, Professor Jack Goldstone, guys. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. It's been a pleasure talking to you both. I wish you good health. Be safe. Thank Have you. a great year.